Our next speaker that's coming up is uh, PJ Leash. P PJ is, uh, is our extension entomologist now. Uh, he, uh, he took Phil Pelletieri's place, so uh, he's the new, younger, better looking version of Phil. I guess he's faster too, he says, but I don't think we've had a foot race done yet. Um, PJ is in charge. His role is, uh, is with the insect diagnostic lab here at Madison. So uh, he's, in, he's the person that if you have a, a question with regard to identification or a management recommendation on insects, he's your go-to guy. Uh, he, uh, he works with his colleagues, of course, at the university. He works with agricultural producers in Wisconsin. He works with a lot of our industry people, too, to uh, help us with any of the potential uh, questions that we might have around insects. And, uh, and of course, he gets into also uh, commercial buildings and things like that. So he's, he's very broad-based and, uh, and diverse, so he would help with insects in like a, a medical facility or in, in a warehouse environment. Uh, PJ uh, works in the outreach. Uh, area. So uh, one of the one of the jobs that he has is that uh, he teaches courses to the uh, farm industry short course. He grew up in Franksville, Wisconsin. For those of you that don't know where Franksville is, it's in the far southeast corner down in uh, Racine County. Uh, and uh, he holds a master's and a uh, bachelor's and a master's from the UW Madison. He has been in charge of the diagnostic lab since uh, 2014. Please welcome PJ Leash. All right, well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. As Scott said, he was going over more the mechanical side of things, whereas I'm talking about the buggy side of things, uh, although it's really great that I'm going after Scott because he introduced a lot of important things that I'm going to go over again, uh, things like simply making sure your bin is clean before you put new grain in there, proper aeration, temperature control, things like that. If you do all those things, that can really prevent a lot of the insect issues. And overall, we have it pretty good in Wisconsin because we have these colder parts of the year called winter. If you go down south or to tropical regions where they're growing rice, that's a nightmare situation down there. So what I want to do today, review some of the, the main groups of stored product, stored grain insects that we see, and then I also want to talk about management. Now, when it comes to the, the three groups of insects that we see, and I'll go into some more of the details, we got internal feeders, external feeders that are, are feeding on fines and damaged grains and things like that. And then we've got a group we call the fungal feeders that aren't feeding on the grain themselves, but if you've got musty grain due to moisture control issues, you get some mold, mildew growing, they're coming in and feeding on that, but they can still be a contamination issue. Now, when it comes to the insects we see in stored grains, about 90% of them are beetles. Uh, and to be honest, they're a little tricky to identify because they're all most of them about an eighth of an inch long and kind of reddish brown. So with the naked eye, really hard to tell what they are. But if you've got a microscope or, or good hand lens, that can help with some resources uh, or having resources that can help identify them. Or if you find something in your grain when you're monitoring, get it to a crop consultant that knows their bugs or get it to a, a, a extension office, extension agent, uh, or get it uh, to me at the diagnostic lab. We can get it figured out because that can have some important implications. If you have a fungal feeder insect in your grain versus a, a secondary feeder, we might be needing to do different things. If it's a fungal feeder, you know, we might need to aerate some more, get that moisture level to drop, and that's going to be a, a bigger impact on those insects. So getting things identified is a, a really important step. Now overall, the insects that we see in Wisconsin, they tend to be the secondary feeders or the fungal feeder groups. We don't really see the primary feeders. And then in terms of management of these pests and grain, really there are a lot of things that we can do without having to rely on insecticides and fumigants and things like that. There's a lot of cultural and mechanical things that we can do. Just general sanitation, um, aeration, temperature, moisture control, which Scott mentioned and we'll talk about in some more details. And then there are some impacts of location on a farm. If you were putting in a new grain storage bin, you probably don't want to put it right next to an area where animals are feeding. Because if we've got cattle feeding uh, and there's spilled grain around, that's a potential uh, location where those insects could be living and, and that could be a reservoir that could get into the grain bin if it's close by. So there's a lot of factors that can impact stored grain insects. Just a very general review of stored grain insect biology, they're cosmopolitan in distribution. What this means is they're found practically everywhere on the planet. If we went back in 
a time machine 500 years ago. Um, that wouldn't be the case, but with modern uh, commodity trades and moving things around, these things have gotten moved around the globe. There are some species uh, like copper beetle that aren't here yet and can be a nasty pest, but a lot of these pests can be found uh, worldwide. And under the right conditions, if it's warm enough, they can reproduce and go through a generation pretty quickly, four to six weeks. Um, so in Wisconsin, that boils down to about two to three generations per year, potentially, uh, during the warmer portions of the year. Now, insects being cold-blooded, um, they are temperature dependent, and so if it gets down to about 50 degrees, that is the critical threshold for development. You get down to 50 degrees or colder, their metabolism grinds to a halt and they are no longer feeding, causing damage for the most part. And so the cooler we can keep grain, the fewer problems we're going to have. So in Wisconsin, two to three generations per year, whereas if you go down to the southern states uh, or you go down to tropical, subtropical areas, they can get 10, 12 generations a year. And so they have it a lot worse off than we do. And why are they so problematic? Well, if you think about a grain bin, it's really this artificial ecosystem. We've got this metal bin. We're putting grain in it. In theory, there shouldn't be any insects in there. But if they do get in, their natural predators aren't there. So we've got to essentially an unlimited food source for these insects. Uh, there's no wolves to take care of the sheep, so to speak. Um, I mentioned earlier, they're small. Most of these insects are an eighth of an inch long, so they can be physically hard to detect. Luckily, we have some probe traps and things like that to keep an eye out for them. They can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions, uh, and they can also be fairly long-lived. If you clean out a bin, um, and maybe there's just some fines and, and cracks, and you let it sit for half a year, well, there's still a chance there could be some stragglers around, so they can survive in some unusual conditions for long periods of time. And they're problematic because uh, even if it's something like a fungal feeder that might not be directly damaging the grain, it's a contamination issue. And so you go to sell it, that uh, the price could be affected, or you might not be able to sell it at all if there are so many insects present. So I mentioned the, the three types of stored grain insects. Primary feeders, uh, these are creatures that feed on whole intact grain. So they could chew their way into a, a whole perfect intact uh, grain of corn, for example, and they basically leave a hollow out shell when they're done feeding. Then we've got the secondary feeders. These can't walk up and start munching on a grain of corn. They need something that is damaged. They can't chew through that outer layer. So if we've got a grain that has been damaged by primary feeders, damaged by physical jostling around, being crushed, or if we've got fines around, they can feed on those type of materials, but they're not going to be munching on whole intact grain. Uh, and then we've got these fungal feeders, which I said they don't attack the grain, but if we have moisture issues and we get mold growing, they're going to show up and feed on that, but they can be a contaminant in the system. So to quickly show you a few of these primary pests, and we really don't see many of these in Wisconsin. Worldwide, there's six or eight major ones. And we see a few in Wisconsin, two to three. Um, there are a number of weevils, like granary, rice, and maize weevils. Uh, there is also a, a critter called the lesser grain borer. And overall, these are not common. If you go to warmer portions of the planet, down south or in the tropics, uh, some of these insects, in some cases, will actually infest grain when it's still standing in the field. And so if you take that grain and you think it's good and you put it into storage, the insects are already there. So that's kind of a, a nightmare situation. And just to show you what these look like, again, most of these beetles are about an eighth of an inch long, kind of reddish brown, so they are kind of hard to tell apart. Weevils are one that you can tell apart fairly easily if you have a small hand lens on you. Um, if weevils were one of the Muppets characters, they would be Gonzo because they've got a very, very long nose that comes off the front of their head. Uh, and there's a few species that can pop up from time to time. We've got granary, rice weevils, there is a maize weevil. Uh, to tell the exact species apart, you need to get them under the microscope and actually dissect out uh, some of the reproductive organs. So it's almost like a miniature scale game of operation, but you need really, really steady hands to do that. And then we've got lesser grain borer. This can be a serious pest of wheat. We'll also get into rice. Every once in a while, it might get into corn, but it doesn't really seem to like corn a whole lot. But uh, the weevils and lesser grain borers, if you see primary pests in Wisconsin, it's probably one of these. In my two years in the diagnostic lab, I think I've seen only one or two cases of these. So they're not common in the state compared to our secondary pests and the fungal feeders. So these secondary pests, we sometimes call them bran bugs um, because they like to get into food products as well. Basically, any type of processed grains, 
or broken or damaged grains or fines they can feed on. And we've got a couple dozen species in the state, 30 or so species that pop up and they can be fairly common. So just some common examples, uh, red flower beetle, um, there is a reason why we had flower sifters historically, because you would get creatures like this getting into the flower, uh, or we can see in that upper right hand picture, uh, that is some of the beetles in comparison to some Cheerios. So they are not big insects to deal with. You do need to get them under the microscope to tell them apart. But red flower beetles can be very common. Uh, some other very common ones, probably some of the most common secondary feeders I see in the state, sawtooth and merchant grain beetles. Very closely related beetle species, almost identical. In that picture on the left, we see that just behind the head, we see this jagged saw-like appearance. That gives them the name of, of sawtooth grain beetle. If you look at the head itself, that picture the upper right, there's some subtle differences behind the eye, so that's how I tell them apart under the microscope. The reason I wanna mention that, um, there is an important biological distinction between the two species, which is that sawtooth grain beetle can't fly. It has to walk wherever it's going. And so if you've got a well-sealed bin for sawtooth grain beetle to get in, if the only way to get in is somewhere up at the top or through a ventilation fan, if that's covered, they're going to have a hard time getting in, whereas merchant grain beetle can fly. So they can move greater distances faster, maybe more likely to get in in the long run. And we can see in that bottom right picture, compared to a penny, these things are just darn small. Mealworms do pop up from time to time, and we really don't see the adults as much as the larva, which is on the left. So that's the juvenile insect. Um, these are the mealworms that you can sometimes find at pet stores to feed to lizards and uh, amphibians and reptiles and things like that. So kind of a hard, crunchy, worm-like creature. And they are one of these secondary feeders as well. Uh, probably our most common one that we see, Indian meal moth. If you peek in your grain bin and you see little grayish moths flying around up above, there's a good chance it's Indian meal moth. There's two, three, four other possibilities, but Indian meal moth is our most common one. Now the thing about the adults, um, they're not really causing any damage to the grain. Their goal in life is to find a mate, to reproduce, lay eggs, and, and that's about it. Whereas the caterpillars that are down living in the grain, they're the problematic life stage. For the adults, we do have some pheromone traps so we can monitor for them. Um, but this one can be a fairly big problem in Wisconsin and other portions of the Midwest um, because of their behavior. So these caterpillars are feeding and they're often at the top of the grain um, and they produce some silk webbing. And that webbing ties together particles of grain or whatever's in the bin, um, that's going to create some crusting, which is going to disrupt airflow. Uh, and as Scott had mentioned, you get disrupt air airflow. Um, that's going to cause moisture issues, condensation. We're going to get mold and mildew popping up in situations like that. And one of the easy ways to tell if you've got them, if you're lowering uh, your grain in the bin, like that picture on the right, and you see those clumps of grain stuck to the side of the bin, almost certainly that is Indian meal moth. They have taken their silk strands, made kind of a clump of, of grain or corn, and it's stuck there. So that's a pretty strong indicator. I do also want to mention there are some known cases of resistance to malathion. Now, if you're using malathion and it seems to work for you in your situation, great, keep that in mind. But if you're using it and it just doesn't seem to be working, you want to keep that in mind that there are some known issues of resistance. And then the fungal feeder insects. I mentioned earlier these don't feed on the grain itself. They're feeding on mold, mildew spores that pop up. Um, and these can be very common. In fact, they're probably the most common stored grain insect that I see in the state. Uh, and they can fly in and be attracted in very large numbers. There's about 15 or so species that uh, are very common in the state. Just some examples of these. Foreign grain beetle. And we can see compared to the tip of the pen that these things are pretty small. Uh, we've got flat grain beetles, which look very similar to a lot of the other beetles we talked about. But if you looked at them sideways, they're, they're not very thick, so relatively flat in appearance. There's a rusty grain beetle, looks very similar. So again, for a lot of these, you need to get them properly identified. Uh, and just to reinforce that, if you identify a fungal feeder versus a secondary primary feeder, we might have some different courses of action because for a fungal feeder, we need to do something about that moisture control, get that moisture down, stop the mold, for example. Hairy fungus beetle, yet another example of fungal feeders that we have in the state. 
We can also get some non-beetles uh, that pop up from time to time. Things like book lice can be very common. Again, they're feeding on fungal spores that are present. So if you got a lot of book lice, that does indicate uh, some type of moisture issue. And then one thing that can be very, very tiny, grain mites. Um, these are uh, about half a millimeter long. So we're talking about a 64th of an inch or something along those lines. So teeny tiny. If you have them and you've got lots of them, they look like walking dust. I mean, they can be present in very high numbers. And if you see them, it really indicates uh, some moisture issues. All right, so moving on to the second part of my talk to talk about uh, insect management in stored grain. And the most important thing we can do is prevention ahead of time. Things like good sanitation, proper storage, uh, aeration, and so on. We'll talk uh, some more about the details of these. We can also do some scouting to check. And so just as Scott mentioned, scouting for moisture and temperature and things like that, we want to be scouting for insects as well. Um, and then if we need to, uh, there are a number of insecticide tools that we have in the toolbox that we can use uh, and choose from. Now, what's the overall story in Wisconsin? I mentioned earlier we really have it pretty good compared to some of the southern parts of the country or some of the tropical and subtropical portions of the world. So in Wisconsin, if we have insect-free grain that is put in, stored into a clean bin, and there's no insects present in that bin, and that bin is in good storage condition, and it goes through the winter, in theory, we should not have any insect problems until the following summer. So that's kind of the theoretical side of things world doesn't always work according to plan. Um, but in Wisconsin, that's kind of the, the general thoughts. Because our winter is cold enough, it's, we're going to get that grain temperature low enough. Insects shouldn't be active or causing any type of damage. So if we have grain that we put into a grain bin, where do these insects come from? Well, there's a number of potential spots they could come from. It could be some grain still in storage. And one of the worst things that you could do is if you have some grain left in a bin and you simply add new grain on top of it. That's a major no-no because there's a chance that there uh, are insects in that grain and they're simply going to move on up and infest the new stuff. Another potential source, any place you have spilled grain, trucks, handling equipment, augers, elevators, uh, animal feed areas. I mentioned earlier, if you have a, a location where you're feeding cattle or, or some other animal on the farm, um, if there's spilled grain, that could serve as a potential reservoir for these insects, and they simply have to walk or fly over uh, and get into a grain storage bin. And then other nearby contaminated grains. So if you've got a bunch of storage bins all lined up and one is contaminated, well, over time, they could potentially move over to the other bins and infest those as well. So any place that you've got some grain sitting around for long periods of time, that's a potential spot where these insects could be coming from and living in. So in terms of prevention, and prevention is really one of the most important things we can do. Before storing grain, we want to clean things out as thoroughly as we can. So get that grain out of the bin, sweep or vacuum it out if possible. Um, also think about uh, transport equipment, trucks and combines, for example. If there's grain that is sitting in those for months and months, that's a potential source of these insects. Handling equipment. Um, so again, any place that grain is sitting around, if we can clean that out, that's going to help us in the long run. Also, before we put grain into the bin, just do a quick inspection. Um, if we are noticing, hey, there's a lot of holes in this bin or, or some issue here, can we physically seal that up? Cover up those little holes, fill them in somehow so that insects have a harder time getting in. That will help prevent issues. Um, if we uh, suspect or just look at a history of our farm and we know that we have some issues with insects, there are some insecticides that we can use at the time we're putting grain into a bin or afterwards for top dressing that we can use um, to help prevent issues. There's also some residual bin sprays. So before we even put grain in, if we know that in the past we had insects in there, we have some sprays we can spray the inside of the bin. That's going to help control and kill off insects that might be in there. And then as Scott had said, if we can store cool, dry grain, that is one of the most important things we can do. If we get that moisture down to a certain level, the insects simply can't survive. And if we get that moisture down, that's going to prevent mold growth. And also, if it's cool, ideally below about 60 degrees. And as I mentioned earlier, the critical threshold for these insects is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature and colder, the insects aren't developing very well. Um, they're essentially dormant. So the cooler we get that grain, and if we get it cold enough down into the 20s, about 25 or so, a lot of these insects die. 
they're not all that robust of insects. They need it to be a fairly narrow range of temperatures for them to do well. So cooler and drier grain uh, is key. With grain storage, I said drier, cooler is better. Um, when it comes to moisture, if we have higher moisture levels, again, that's going to cause mold to grow and develop. That's going to draw in those fungal feeders. Um, ideally, if the moisture is 12, 13 percent, that's going to be at that threshold where it's a lot. Of, it's pretty tough for insects to survive. So again, the drier we can get that grain, the better. Um, and as I mentioned before, insects can't survive or they don't develop below about 50 degrees. So the colder we get it, the harder they're going to have. And in general, every 10 degrees temperature drop, you're going to uh, double the storage life roughly. And I know Scott showed this picture earlier, but uh, as we see that blue bar, um, that is that period or that temperature range where insects are essentially dormant. So again, below 50 degrees, if we can get below that temperature, insects, even if they're present, they're not going to be doing a whole lot. Whereas during the summer months, if it's up in the 60s or 70s, the insects can be very active. And if it's 70 degrees, remember those insects can go through two to three generations per year. And so if you miss something, you weren't scouting for those insects, they could reproduce fairly quickly in a matter of a couple months. So we want to keep it below 50. If we get it down below freezing, um, that can be be very beneficial as well to actually kill some insects. But again, as Scott was mentioning, we do have to monitor temperatures. If we get too much of a difference between what's in the grain and the environment, we can get condensation and moisture issues. So we want to keep an eye on that. And if we do have moisture issues, of course, we're going to end up with moldy grain like this. And really the way to help prevent that and correct it is with the proper aeration techniques that Scott talked about. So we've harvested our grain. Uh, now what? I mentioned earlier, if we have insect-free grain that's stored properly in a clean bin, we really shouldn't have any infestation or insect issues until the following summer in theory. But remember, insects can be active above about 50 degrees or so, so we do want to keep an eye on things uh, through scouting. So there are some tools out there. Um, they're not complex uh, devices at all, but they can be very effective. For some insects, there are pheromone traps. Um, and then one of the most common ones, I'm sure everyone has seen these, but the probe traps that you push down into the grain um, and you can come back and check. Now, in terms of scouting, um, you want to scout probably about every two to three weeks. And that's uh, kind of the longest interval you would want to go. During the summer, you may even want to be doing it weekly. And if you're going out and scouting for temperature and other conditions, you know, scout for insects at the same time. And as Scott also mentioned, it's important to take notes because we can't necessarily remember, did we see those insects last week or was that six weeks ago or three weeks ago? And so you want to keep a log and, and watch for insect activity. During the cooler portions of the year, you could inspect for insects about every three to four weeks, roughly once a month or so, just to keep an eye on things. Again, if it's below 50, they shouldn't be doing much, but you want to keep an eye out for them. If you discover an infestation, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, collect some specimens because we need to get them properly identified. So if you've got the resources and tools to do that, that's great. If you don't get it to a, a crop consultant or a county agriculture extension agent or send them in to me at the diagnostic lab, we can get them identified because, as I said earlier, if you've got fungal feeders versus some of these secondary or primary feeders, they may have different management approaches that we need to do. So we need to be able to tell the different species apart. And then when it comes to insecticides for dealing with these insects, uh, I mentioned we have residual bin sprays. These are products we can spray onto the inside of the bin before we fill it with grain. That will help control any stragglers that may still be around. Um, there's a number of those out there. There are grain protectants. These are products that we apply to that moving grain stream as it's going into the storage bin. Uh, there are some surface treatments. Essentially, we call these top dressing sometimes, or you could um, treat the, the grain, or you might not treat the grain and it's going in the bin, but you just simply treat that upper surface. Um, so that's an option with some products. And then kind of the hammer in the toolbox, so to speak. If we get an infestation, we have to do something about it. Um, one of the options we rely on fumigants, and these are basically a, a gaseous vapor phase that will diffuse throughout the grain bin. Um, it doesn't have residual, but it can be very effective for killing off insects. Now, a few other notes I want to point out. You need to check the pesticide label. Remember, the label is the law. And so you need to check for any product you're going to use, that it's OK to use it on the particular type of grain that you're putting into storage. There are some products that may say 
you can use it on just about anything under the sun. There are some other ones that might say you can only use it on corn, but not wheat, for example. Um, so you need to always check the label. And then one other thing to keep in mind is you, uh, it can be helpful to chat with the buyer of the grain beforehand. So for example, there are some products containing diatomaceous earth, and you might have a buyer that says, you know, we really don't want that used on the grain that we're buying because it just makes a mess in our processing, handling equipment. And it's good to know that ahead of time. Otherwise, you might have to be looking around for another buyer. So those are some pieces of practical advice. When it comes to fumigation, just a very few brief notes. Um, we're going to get better results with higher temperatures. This has to do with the, the chemical activity of those fumigants. And when it's cold, gases just don't diffuse and move around very well. And also, if you look at the label, it's going to say you have to be above 40 degrees. So in general, the warmer the temperatures, fumigation tends to work a little bit better. In terms of the products we have available, uh, if you look back 10, 15 years ago, we had more options. But uh, today, we're really left with uh, phosphine, which are typically applied as these little tablets. Uh, and and then sulfuryl fluoride, things like profume and so on. So those are really our, our two options that we have for fumigation. Um, and then that's it for me. I'd be happy to take any questions for, let me back up just briefly, for uh, the fumigants and uh, the insecticides. These are, uh, we redid these in the, the state extension crop management manual. So the, the products are listed in there. And also in the handout today, I list some useful resources for finding information on these, as well as some other information on um, dealing with stored grain insects. So my contact information is up here, and I'd be happy to take any questions from the audience. I will also be sticking around for the mornings here. Welcome to chat with me individually if you'd like.